My name is Sylvester and I'm an atmospheric cloud physicist. I did my master, PhD, and currently I'm employed as a postdoc researcher at the Faculty of Physics. Besides, well, or mainly, I'm a programmer, Linux user since, well, 99, something like that. I found a Linux counter email dated June 99. Two years later, started to, well, earn money programming. Seven years later, started open source. Uh, and for the last like, six years, I'm an everyday C++ programmer. Uh, also quite active in, well, I don't know, quite active or not in FOSS community. Uh, frequent bug reporting, a few patches a year. Once I did a boost review uh, for a library and that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's about my work, the, the, the talk today. And recently at work, uh, like four, last four years, I co-created a programming team at the uh, Atmospheric Physics Division, a C++ programming team. Uh, this year I'm lecturing C++ to first year uh, graduate students, or well, undergraduate uh, physicists. And at work in this programming team we develop open source C++ libraries. That's the main uh, activity. Okay, so uh, that will be a bit of a repeat from the last talk. Uh, uh, great talk, <laughs> let me add to it. So what does atmospheric cloud physicists do with programming? So uh, there are some problems to solve and it's a kind of a toy sketch of a, a typical problem to solve. You can imagine it's a weather map, but you can think of it as in any scale. I mean, it can be a single cloud or weather in this room or weather in Europe, global. Basically, there are some grids and some properties of the, of the air and uh, the atmosphere. And what we need to solve is mainly the time evolution of the state of the system. And it consists of two main parts. One is uh, hydrodynamics, that's the transport of air. And second one is thermodynamics, and that these are the phase changes. So that's the cloud modeler perspective. I mean, for numerical weather prediction, most of the computations are probably uh, still the data simulation, etc. But I'm a, I'm a researcher. We do not do things operationally, so we work with idealized cases and do research on clouds. So that's the two main uh, topics. So that's the problems to solve, but there are problems with solving them. And one of the problems is the the that was well. Uh, so that's, that's a bit controversial, controversial and uh, maybe a uh, uh, person with my experience shouldn't say such things, but you can find the nature papers and other important sources of information that claim that something is not really working in computational physics, computational science. I'm not saying that at all, but a stereotype computational uh, uh, science workflow doesn't really fit what uh, we all uh, feel like a uh, proper programming workflow what we can hear so so well this is actually this is an image from the nature journal with this f77 keyword anyhow scientific computing and atmospheric sciences we are all its users for example weather prediction it has a very long tradition and notorious inertia Codes from 80s happen to be used still today, really. Uh, and it's not uncommon to hear of new codes written in Fortran 77, really. Of course, it's great that we can hear that there are other developments, but I would say that especially in research, not in operations, uh, things happen to have really big inertia. And that's because all, well, one of the reasons is that uh, the research is mostly done by people that work in a publish or perish system. I mean, we get credit for publishing. We don't get credit for uh, other things like embracing code reuse, unit testing, open source development model, modern coding techniques. These are generally not, they are becoming, but still they are not part of the scientist credit system. Okay, yep. Well, you know, if you publish your libraries as part of Boost, would get credit for it. As a, mm, the, the, sorry. 
<laughs> I will repeat the comment that publishing a library in uh, the Boost collection would bring me some credit. Uh, it would bring me some credit at this place, at this conference, or if I would like to find a job in as a C++ programmer, but it wouldn't help me if I would like to go for a good research group in a good university. Unfortunately. So, I would say that in a longer perspective, all above, the FOS development model, uh, testing, uh, uh, modern coding techniques, uh, can bring good things to uh, scientific uh, computational world like code readability and quality, software maintainability, res result reproducibility. And of course, I don't have to convince you about it. The point is that in our group we have convinced a funding agency and we got a budget for a three year long software development project that even has object orientation in the title. And it was funded as a project in physics uh, by Polish National uh, Science Center. Uh, the budget is one quarter million euro, so something for a team of programmers with no need to buy equipment just for uh, paying the uh, people and well, attending conferences like today and in this project it's, it's based in Warsaw the Faculty of Physics but we collaborate with ECMWF and with NCAR at Boulder here in Colorado so this talk will be about the first results first software release and that is uh, that is an outcome of this project that is still ongoing let me acknowledge that uh, well I'm I'll talk about what all those people did. So it's, uh, we have a group in Warsaw, uh, both here. Uh, for here are only C++ programmers. For the last three years, we are doing C++ coding. And we collaborate with uh, guys at Boulder and with uh, Professor Smoralkiewicz at Reading and the ECMWF Center. So, before I begin uh, describing the, the, the libraries we developed, I'll try to spend some time, maybe too much, but maybe it's more important, uh, just to explain what kind of coding we are doing and what kind of problems, how the problems I mentioned look uh, from a coding perspective. So let me try to, I hope I will make it in 10 minutes, uh, show a kind of 50 line hello world for cloud modeling. So I mentioned this picture, that's the conceptual problem, and I will just shrink it to a even more simple problem, that is the transport of air. So we need to solve equations, partial differential equations, for transport of fluid in the atmosphere. Because if the cloud is there, in one hour it's there. And that's, we call th these problems advection-dominated problems, because advection in atmosphere is really the advection that is transport synonym it's, uh, it's important. Okay, so I already mentioned that usually we need to have a grid. Well, always we need to have a grid. Sometimes it's not physical uh, in physical dimensions, but still there is a grid. So we need to express a grid uh, in a program. So uh, this will be these 50 lines Hello World. I know that Hello World programs do not have 50 lines, but still for cloud modeling, I need... I realized I need 50 lines to show a quick example. So starting here in the left column, you can see that we work with blitz arrays. Uh, I will try to come back to it at the end of the talk to discuss why and uh, maybe ask you uh, why not. Uh, but anyhow, we decided to use blitz arrays four years ago and uh, we, said we had to decide something. Blitz, arrays are, blitz is a library that is intended for uh, it simply provides array containers in C++. So here uh, I declare my problem to be two-dimensional, but in atmospheric physics we do zero-dimensional, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. If you include time and some other things, we go further. And we need a library that supports arrays in that number of dimensions. So we need multi-dimensional array containers in C++. Uh, this next line is just, the next two lines are just a shortcut notation to have, not to write blitz range. Blitz range is a index, a part slice of an, well, a way to describe slice of an array. And blitz array 
is the container instead of vector and array. We use doubles and we use two dimension. Okay, so then basically any simulation, well, a typical simulation program in cloud modeling, atmospheric modeling, would have a something, well, would start with an initial condition that's here, 63, 68 lines. So the psi is an array, a blitz array. And first I set all values to zero, and then I put at point one one a value of one. It's not Fortran indexing. I use one one to depict this cloud because I need also a halo region. So I need a buffer around the domain to handle boundary conditions. But well, anyhow, just to mention that uh, these one and one are not from coming from Fortran. And well, then I print the output from this program. And as of now, this program just uh, allocates memory for this array and prints the initial condition. So we have a grid and we have one here. So let's call it one gram of water or presence of cloud, etc. And now what we want to solve is the time evolution of it. Of it. So to, to do it, we need a loop. So here, line 40, is a time-stepping loop. There's three iterations. We will see what is the next step stage. And in every single time step, we do something with this psi. We compute the evolution basing on the current state. Uh, here I use a temporary array to store the output. Uh, then we say that the previous time step, that the next time step becomes the previous time step, and we go forward. Simulation. So this is the cycle arise from the Blitz API, and we output uh, the state every time step. And the result is like that. So we just added zeros to the array. So the time stepping result is just in repeating the values, but still you can see that we <coughs> see our simulation going in time. So let's say uh, we had a cloud here, we have a cloud here, cloud here, cloud here, and now what we want to do is to add time evolution to it. So we will know how the cloud moves in the atmosphere. So first, here, line 31, I need to specify how this cloud moves in the atmosphere. I need wind. So I specify a vector. By vector, I'm mathematically vector. Well, two uh, values that say that this cloud will move half a grid point in x direction, half a grid point in y direction every time step. And what I've added as well is the term here. So this uh, expression of the trans partial differential equation for transport is here. It has two terms, the contribution from transport in x direction and y direction. So first, let's start with x direction. And we'll have a function that will define what is this change due to transport. And it will, it will need to know what is the psi, the current state. It will need to know what's the wind. And indices too, well, just to know what's the extent of the domain. Okay, so this is the x term. And how it can be defined? It's here. Uh, basically, it's a function uh, that takes the array as argument, as can be seen here, and returns also something that mathematically we can think of as an array. It will not be an array in a programming sense, but it returns something that represents the uh, values uh, on a grid. It will not be an array because it will not be evaluated at the time. It will be lazy evaluated. So just return an expression, a recipe of what I will do, but there is no computation coming on in at this point. Only when it will hit a assignment, uh, it will evaluate it and transform it into a loop over the domain and execute the process. So what is here is simply that it says that for every ij in the grid, if I take the wind, multiply it by the value in my current grid, it will be the outflow from this grid cell. And I, I take the wind and multiply by the value uh, on the left-hand side, on the, uh, from the grid cell to my left, it will give me the inflow. So now I know how to specify the inflow and outflow for, for every grid cell. Okay? And this is what happens with this program. I needed C++14 to make this code shorter because the lazy evaluation in Blitz requires the function to return, uh, well, it's a crazy one-page long type of expression of arrays. So Fortunately, we started our project when C++11 was there. 
with C14 is even better. Anyhow, what you can see here is that this one with the wind, as of now, is just one direction. So it just goes downwards. And in one step, half of the signal moved to the other grid cell, half of the signal remained. Next step, it goes farther, farther, farther. Of course, you can see that there is something crazy going on because uh, the cloud starts to populate the whole domain, and it's called numerical diffusion. So there are clever algorithms that have little numerical diffusion. There are less clever algorithms that are cheap, sometimes very useful, but have numerical diffusion as here. So even though we simply move the cloud in the domain, due to this discretization, it gets diffused. OK, so finally, we want to address this. We want to complete the program and uh, do the transport in the other direction. Of course, the recipe is the same. It's simply the same function, but we have to apply it in the other direction, in the, with the other dimension. And this is something that is hard to do in Fortran. We'll play with templates. The template argument will de define the dimension. The call is the same. And here, what change? Here, I simply call a permutation of indices before indexing the array. So we keep the function, but we permute what it does. And it's something that makes use of the object orientation of blitz. The fact that the array is an object, the array index is an object, array slice is an object, multidimensional array slice is also an object, etc. So I can overload, I can return from a function. It's useful and not possible in Fortran. OK, so the final thing is how to implement the permutation. A template that is specialized, uh, this is template pi, takes two indices and simply permutes them depending on the template in the argument, if I want zero dimension, one dimension. Not going into details. The whole program is here, the output is here, the cloud moves following the dia di diagonal. Okay? So this is a hello world. It was just to say, to explain what the type of problems we are addressing at work and why C++ might be used. OK, so the highlight of this hello world is that object orientation is useful for expressing blackboard abstractions. Uh, that is what a physicist or mathematician would write into a program. So when a mathematician takes, gives a lecture and explains you how to solve advection, he never writes a loop or a function. No, he writes equations. And then, it used, these equations used to be transformed into Fortran, adding the loops, well, with modern Fortran, less loops, but still adding a lot of uh, decoration. Uh, and object orientation with such containers or blitz helps to make this decoration a bit less visible in the code and to make the blackboard abstractions also visible in the code. And I would argue that such abstractions are a bit of this indirection that was mentioned by uh, uh, sorry, Diago. Diago on the last lecture. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's useful for blackboard, blackboard abstractions uh, and for expressing these blackboard abstractions we need multidimensional array containers, that's atmospheric modeling perspective, uh, we need to make it uh, perform. Uh, uh, we need to make it fast and to perform it optimally. So uh, that's the story of expression template based, uh, loop free, uh, and temporary object free expressions. Basically, uh, a good way to implement array arithmetics in C++. I, well, I will not go into details. For those who uh, are acquainted, the expression template keyword is there. Basically, we need not to incur any overhead due to this object orientation. Uh, what was in already in this hello world are array valid functions. And that's one thing that is quite tricky in Fortran, especially when we want to uh, obtain separation of concerns. We, we have a nice equation in the book or somewhere which has plenty of terms. These terms are described on different pages in the book. And we want to combine it into one fast loop in our code. But this one fast loop uh, that might take 
long time to compute would best be split it into separate files, into separate functions. Each function would clearly do something simple and do it good. Uh, well, and this separation of concerns is really much easier to obtain with object orientation, with the Blitz containers, for example, than with uh, more native, uh, like in Fortran array objects. Multidimensional object oriented array indexing. I mentioned this permuta permuted indices, uh, a way to also. Uh, make the code simpler, not to repeat code in every dimension, just to code once and apply the operation many times. And these five topics were, uh, were, are described in detail in a paper that we published at the beginning of our project. It's in Scientific Programming Journal. That's the way we are trying to get credit, <laughs> even <laughs> doing programming in physics. And the paper is full more translation in Blitz, NumPy, and Modern Fortran. So we coded a bit extended kind of a hello world in three languages, all object oriented, and compare expressibility, performance, readability, etc. So if you are interested, it's here. Okay, so plan of this talk. I'm done with the introduction. There are the two libraries that we develop, and then I have a final remark. So I'm perfectly aware that most of you are not potential users of these libraries. The second one was my PhD. I love to talk, no, I don't love to talk about it, but <laughs> I will not try to talk to you about my PhD in physics. So, internationally, I will go through these topics quite quickly, and then go back to programming with the last part. So, mm, it's intentional. I will just go quickly through it, but I also want to show that it works. So, libmp data. Open source project at GitHub. There, is, there are some pointers on the website. Uh, and basically, it's about going from hello world to real world uh, in context of the code I presented in, in the first section. So, if we go to real world, we have multiple dimensions. Well, at least three in atmosphere. The f function that does advection grows to few thousands of lines of code per dimension if you get a clever algorithm, for example, to make it diffusion-free. So, this code, this array operations, <sighs> blow. Uh, we have multiple transported fields, like it was addressed in the uh, keynote talk. So we transport not only cloud, but precipitation, uh, turbulence, intensity, uh, momentum, uh, well, dozens or more. We need boundary conditions, we need concurrency, we need input-output, we need more physics to it. It was just transport, but well, it's not only transport that happens in the atmosphere. And all the things together are addressed in the libmp data library, and libmp data library is called libmp data because it implements mp data algorithm. It was written by Piotr Smolarkiewicz. The algorithm was uh, invented by Piotr Smolarkiewicz. Uh, he is a Polish mathematician who spent last 30 years here in Colorado at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and last two years he works at or more. He works in ECNWF. Uh, as uh, European Research Council advanced grant um, uh, researcher. So, MP data is basically one of the methods to solve this transport problem in a very accurate way. Some statistics from Google. First MP data article, 94, 84, up to now over 600 citations. In Google Scholar, you can find about 700 papers mentioning MP data algorithm. 200 books in Google Books that mention MP data. But the original single file Fortran 77 implementation is used still today. <coughs> yep? So, so is this a finite volume method or what are talking about here? It's the family of finite volume. Uh, it's finite difference, finite volume. Okay. Well, uh, it's a, I mean, uh, Piot was working very intensively during the, this 30 years to grow it into a family of algorithms. So if you look at it from one point, it's finite volume, from other point, finite difference. Uh, yeah, it's not something else. It's something in between finite volume and finite difference. How big is this file? This? <laughs> you want to know? <laughs> 100, 300? How many lines? 300,000? 
over all of what you mentioned. Two million. <laughs> no, no. No, okay. Uh, Is it a secret? <laughs> Unspecified license, no versioning, email distribution, copy, paste, modify, reuse. That's a quick description. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> is, is, is it true there's actually a script that contains the Fortran code? Yes. It compiles the yeah. It's this whole build system also inside, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, but let me add something. <laughs> Piotr is one of the best mathematicians I've ever met. Yes. And simply he's not a programmer. And <laughs> no, he, he's, a, he's a very good programmer. Okay, let's put like, he's not a software engineer. There is some, I think the, the, the issue, I, I, would be, I would like to be very clear with this slide. There is some issue I mentioned with this computational science uh, credit system uh, and the, the, the publish or perish word. It simply makes it possible for an algorithm that is mentioned really in every good textbook on weather prediction or fluid dynamics, simply not to exist in public domain and not to be available and not to conform to modern coding techniques. So, and it's absol absolutely not a, f yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm putting his name here because he invented a great algorithm. And I mean, inventors of Fourier transform are not, uh, are, I mean, are not to blame for how it's get, it gets implemented. <laughs> so just to be very clear, I wish all of you to have opportunity to talk about maths with Piotr. It's, it's uh, one of the brilliant minds. Okay, but it created a niche for us. We applied for money, we got the money, and we created LimbMP Data++. Blitz-based implementation of the, uh, the whole family of algorithms. It doesn't cover all the options. It's a first release. Uh, we got, I would call it an over of order of magnitude lower number of lines of code. It depends on how you count it. Maybe two orders of magnitude, one order of magnitude. Good. I mean, only the permutation stuff that cuts the two dimensions out of the code just gives you uh, a, a great shortening. Comparable performance and major improvement in reusability and maintainability. Okay, very quick slide about the design choices. GPL at GitHub. Uh, the library is composed of several layers. There are solvers, different to choose. Boundary conditions, different to choose. Output handlers, HDF5 binary format, HDF5 with XML annotations, or something for the purpose of well, lectures, uh, interaction with students, or paper quick demos. It's GNU plot output. So the library is able to just show you the result uh, without any intermediate storage. Concurrency handler, up, up to now we only use uh, shared memory, but the design does not block uh, going into this written memory. And we have options to use OpenMP, boost thread, or C11 threads. Dependencies. C11, Blitz, Boost. We use PTR containers, timer, thread, preprocessor, file system format, and property tree. CMake and CTest. The API, header only library, template, template based component selection. So to compose these components into a simulation instance, we use templates. Uh, we use inheritance for component extensions. So like within solvers, we have a simple solver, more advanced solver, etc., and they built on top of uh, the previous one. It's the same as in the textbook. First chapter gives you just transport, and second chapter gives you transport with sources. So our class for transport with sources inherits from the class that does transport. And the user is exposed to the Blitz API. So we do not hide it. It's, it's built on top of Blitz, and the user has to use Blitz to communicate with the library. OK. Yep. Uh, another hello world. Another hello world that doesn't have three lines. It's a bit longer. So I will not go into the details of the code, just to say that this is a, this GNU plot output hello world from the library. The signal in the domain, one dimensional signal, gets advected in time. Uh, first part, selection of components, the header files, separately the solver, separately concurrency, separately output. Uh, we have a structure that defines compile time parameters, uh, like algorithm options, number of equations, number of dimensions, the type. These are used to, these are passed as a template argument, a lot of enable ifs, etc. 
Then we use templates to compose this all together. Let me switch to the next one. Sorry, I will not go into detail. Uh, then we have runtime parameters, like domain size, output frequency. Again, templates to choose concurrency, boundary conditions, some input, uh, con in initial condition. You can see blitz uh, syntax here, loop free. Uh, well, that's the bell shape that was in the picture generated here. We say what's the wind, again, it's half. The library, the, the MP data algorithm behaves best for half. <laughs> and we advance it by 100 time steps. We have a CMake. Uh, if you install the library with CMake, do make install. A CMake, uh, well, the, the CMake file that enables you to write find package lib MP data gets installed. So having these 60, the 36 lines of calls and this six lines of CMake file, you can just write this, uh, CMake, compile, execute, and it will get this picture. No added code, that's all. So that's just an idea how the library works. And now I will go even quicker. Uh, no, not yet, <laughs> sorry. Uh, again, how we try to get credit for it. We published a paper uh, that basically is the documentation of the library. It contains the API, example programs, description how to compile it, how to use it. Unfortunately, since recently, there, is a, there are journals that encourage or accept this kind of papers. That's the Geoscientific Model Development Journal. The paper is there. Nice thing is that in their policy, actually the revised policy from 2013, they state that each paper must be accompanied by the code or means of accessing the code for the purpose of peer review. So you can see here how the community is reluctant to change. They don't say that it has to be open. No, it has to be open for peer review because they know that it's sometimes impossible. People will simply not do it. And the journal also has to take care of itself and gain impact factor, etc. So even though they are so open, so pro reproducibility, etc., they are reluctant to state that the code must be open. And they strongly encourage the referees to compile the code and run test, run test cases supplied by the authors. And actually, when we submitted this journal, during the reviews, that both reviewers did clone our repository, did run the test cases, and they even managed to run the things that were not in the paper and got some problems and described them. Well, but, I mean, it worked. In this case, it worked. The, the editor did a really good job and found two reviewers that were actually, I think, both lecturers of C++ and Fluid Dynamics. So it was really great. That's how the paper looks like. We have plots, we have equations, but we have also code. So it's all together in, in the paper. Okay, and now it will be the... Oh, sorry. I need half a minute. No, two ten seconds. Uh, mm, very sorry. I just took the animations from the PDF to make it compile quicker, uh, finishing the slides. I mentioned that we use inheritance for uh, extension of components. So basically, this is the transport equation. And we can plug some input data and parameters to make the kind of simulations here. It's like sphere and some signal advected over a sphere. This simulation is 100 lines of code with libmp data. And there is a, you can click here and get to the code at the GitHub repository. When we extend it to uh, advection equation with source terms, with prognose velocity, with pressure solver, and we plug user code there, we can get simulation of warm bubble in the air. So, yeah. 
just to say, show that it works. And this is 200 lines of code with the library. The code is there. Then we can do some uh, 3D stuff with shallow water equations. Just going very quickly, just to show the pictures. And here to show also that this result actually uh, got published last month in Journal of Computational Physics. And it already uses the library. Uh, it's a paper on analytical solution of this shallow water equations, but it uses the library to test how the analytical solution compares with numerical. Uh, 100 lines of code. Then we can do some funny stuff with turbulence. Funny stuff with turbulence in larger domains. Well, it works. Just to say that it's not only for doing one dimensional thing, it can also solve problems uh, that are applicable to in research. <sighs> okay. So, next thing is the second library, Cloud Physics Library, my PhD. It's for modeling what happens in clouds, how the droplets form, what's happening in the clouds, how they precipitate, etc. We use the technique called particle-based simulations. We have a domain. We put some particles in it. We call them droplets. So we assign some radius to it. The same radius as a rain particle has when it hits your windshield. That's this radius. We think of what's inside the particle. For due to limited computational resources, we say that each particle in the simulation represents 10 to the 10 frill particles. Uh, I'll come back to it. And when we plug this library to the LangBMP data, it solves transport. This is an example domain with a kind of a eddy in the atmosphere. And we combine this transport with representation of clouds. We get some this kind of pictures. X direction, Y direction, just two-dimensional slab of an atmosphere, stratocumulus cloud, and then we switch rain. Well, we switch collisions between particles. We don't say it's rain. And you can see here that rain forms and falls. Yeah. So also some research done with the libraries. Now I will come back to programming. This first part is spin-up. The, the, the model has to adjust the solution to the equations. So, the, the, uh, the picture I've shown was generated with something that we call cloud reactor. It depends, it's dependent on the two libraries, transport equations, phase changes. For the phase changes, we use the fast library to code our algorithm in, the, uh, in a way that it can be compiled on CPU or GPU. So we have one C++ code and we can combine it, compile it for both. We use boost units to assign physical units to all quantities in the library. So the compiler checks if we correctly did the analytical derivations on paper. So we cannot add joules to newtons, that's my point. The compiler checks if we do it correctly. We use the other int library, I think that was introduced during last boost conference here. In the BMP data we have this. Uh, also we include boost dependencies. And finally the Program uses Boost program options and Spirit to parse input. So we use Boost. I'll go through it again. Just cloud, some rain. Also published in GMD, not yet, uh, well, it's accepted, but not yet in a final form. So this is a type of, um, this is how it looks during peer review. Also in the paper, we have details about the API. Here is a, a sequence diagram, how to call the library, etc. We also implemented Python bindings for the library uh, using Boost Python. So we use C++ for numerical intensive algorithms and for <coughs> GPU, CPU, and we use Python for rapid development and for interfacing with other languages. By interfacing with other languages, I also mean interfacing with Fortran. We had this crazy idea to, we needed to use some Fortran codes, and we had a crazy idea to run everything from Python, load the Fortran code as a shared library, load C++ code as a shared li library, have a common addressing space, throw around function pointers, and play with calling C++ from Fortran via Python using CFFI and Boost Python. Well, just to say that we did. Okay, yep? The, I have a question regarding, you have a, is this a header only library? No, th this one is oh, not. This one is not. Due to, uh, the, the transport equation library is header only. This one has three components like three distinct ways of representing clouds. Two of them are header-only, but the third one uses GPU, and uh, then it's, uh, it 
ships with a set of headers and shared object file that, that enables you to switch GPU, CPU, OpenMP serial at runtime. So we compile all versions into the shared library. Exactly. Did you have to do something? The question was, is the fact that we did not uh, make this very library header only some consequences in terms of limitations for the values of template parameters? So, not, not values, but, well, uh, yeah? The, in the, the version that's running in Python is bound into, by, into Python is no longer. It, it's instantiated templates, right? Exactly. Did for, you have to make <laughs> For example, the Python one supports only double precision. It's an example. So we, yeah, yes, we did have to do it this way. OK, so I have five minutes. And as I mentioned, I'm aware that probably there are not much potential users of the libraries here. But I hope that in this room there are some potential um, people that can answer my question if it was correct that we use Blitz. And maybe then we can talk a bit about it. So. The last part is... We're, we're actually... We're yeah, I'm not sure. right. Yeah. I think it's fine because the next talk is only half an hour okay. as opposed to any yeah. 12, 15, so... Is it okay? Uh, yeah, it's fine. Oh, wait, wait, I want to mention... I'm just going to mention those people outside, but... Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so the final part is uh, just a remark about n-dimensional array containers in C++. So, we have a large choice of them. We can use bleeds. Since recently we have uh, multidimensional array containers in Eigen, they were, they were not there when we started. Armadillo, Boost Multi Array, Val Array in the standard library, and probably some more. These are containers for expressing multidimensional arrays, so 3D and more. Uh, all have different features. I wish I knew all the features of this library, but it took me three years to know Blitz well. So, I mean, if any of you can comment which would be a better choice of our other choices, I'm really welcome to hear suggestions. Anyhow, one of my points is that what we lack is a kind of NumPy-like de facto standard that would enable writers of foreign library libraries to offer object orientation. As of now, in every context that we want to combine our code with anything from outside, we have to switch to C pointers. And we lose all the nice uh, sanity of the object-oriented code. We use all the uh, features that enable the compiler to help us. And if we would have something like a boost multidimensional array container that could hopefully, well, go into other libraries that would just support, just throw me a boost array and I will understand it. As of now, you, can, you have to pass double pointer and a long set of ints that will describe the shapes, strides, etc. Anyhow, pros and cons of bonds. Boost how I of blitz how I understand it. Um, yep. There, there are currently proposals for multi-dimensional multi arrays into the standard. So my bypass was completely illustrated. Would be even better. And I hope the next slides will maybe be relevant. Yep. The, the, the comment was that there is a proposal, or there will be a proposal, to include multidimensional array containers actually in the standard and not boost. Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm under the impression that and there are some other committee members present um, that that effort would benefit greatly from more input from the user community. Yes. The comment was that the committee or the, the programming community, that's how I understood the comment, that, that the programming community, so, uh, the boost development community, C++ development community needs more feedback from the, well, physicists, let's say, or those that use it. And that's exactly what I have of on the next four slides. Yep. Function is the same 
type of array in Fortran, because otherwise it's just not going to be used. The majority of some of the codes that are using C++ are at some point calling for Fortran. The second thing is that when you're iterating over the elements, the default mode should be that it iterates over the elements in the unit stride, unit stride in memory, because that's fairly important for for, for for So what I mean by that is each iteration is going to hit, is going to be maxing the memory location that's plus one. So the co um, let me respond. Yeah. The only me that does nothing at all. No, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just mentioning it's S G and I forget its number, but the numerics six. Um, study group of the C++ committee. They are the people that need to hear that, and the only way they're going to really hear it is if someone write. They work only one way, and that someone writes a paper and goes to a meeting and presents it. That you could you could talk to the whole rest of the world, but they don't listen. All they they need a paper document, you know, or, or PDF. And someone presented. Uh, uh, comment was that the committee needs someone to present these needs. I would love to do it. The previous comment was that Fortran interoperability is in import essential, and I don't agree. Sorry, <laughs> because I mean it. Would, it would be great. It, it would be great as a final stage, but as of now, using multidimensional arrays in C++ for C++ programmers only in C++ world is really cumbersome. And let's first tackle this problem and then approach Fortran users. Because I'm a C++ guy, I don't write any line of I, I, Fortran code and I have real problems with expressing my ideas in C++. I'm just, I'm just, my point is just that the, the, the major users in the US community... Let's finish the talk. Yeah, so, uh, I will do this slide quickly and next slide I will skip kind of intentionally, but the next five slides have five short hello world codes that show the features of Blitz that we think are essential for good array containers. So if anyone is interested, you can just go to the slides and see these short programs uh, for several features that we find essential. And I think that not of all of them are replicated in other libraries. And to get short, <laughs> Blitz has no active development, but a great mailing list. Unmaintained docs, but well-written docs. Not part of Boost, which is a problem with when we ship the code, but it has built-in support for Boost MPI and Boost Serialize. Uh, it has SIM support, but only for ICC, but it has SIM support. Uh, template multi-screen error messages, but very convenient debug mode. No library for binary I.O., but built-in I.O. stream compatibility. Uh, unfortunately, it has partly preprocessor-based API, uh, but it has a very well suited API for computational physics. As Fortran, it was written for computational physicists. And my understanding, my impression is that other uh, array container libraries in C++ were not really written with computational physicists in mind. And that's why we have some problems. Okay, as I mentioned, here are some example programs for index arithmetics, for indexing with single object, for tensor notation, for array valued functions, for elemental functions, for ternary operators and reductions, and that's it. If anyone is interested, just there are these examples programs in my slide. I, I didn't want to explain them all. I just wanted to say that there are some people that still use Blitz. It's an old library I maintain, but it's hard to find these features elsewhere. Last slide. My message, C++ does constitute a viable alternative to Fortran for maintainable code and reproducible results in cloud modeling. Well, I know I don't have to convince you, but I somehow managed to convince my coworkers. Multidimensional C++ array containers. Question to you, is there any alternative to Blitz? Does Boost provide it? Should Boost provide it? And message, Blitz needs new features and maintenance. Maybe some of you can help. Acknowledge the funding, Polish National Science Center, Polish Ministry of Science. Thank you for your attention and I will take the freedom just to say that my wife and son decided to move to Toulouse and I'm looking for a C++ programmer job <laughs> in Toulouse. Yeah.